Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Tevidala, one of the adult psychiatrists at the Behavioral Health Old Bridge Medical Center. <coughs> I'm also an assistant professor at Hackensack uh, Marian School of Medicine. Today we are going to talk about perinatal and postpartum depression. <coughs> so before we start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about statistics of depression. Depression is, uh, uh, you know, one of the leading cause of disability, as we all know, among, you know, adults in the United States. And uh, the prevalence of depression in general among women is 3.2 percent uh, higher than men, according to National Institute of uh, Mental Health. Um, in regards to depression during pregnancy, it's more common in women who give birth. About 10 percent of uh, uh, pregnant women and women who has just given birth experience depression according to World Health Organization. And it is estimated that women um, who discontinue uh, medication uh, during pregnancy, antidepressant medication during pregnancy are uh, five times more um, likely to relapse as compared to women uh, who continued their antidepressant medication uh, during pregnancy. So a little bit about perinatal depression. It is defined as a depression in pregnancy around childbirth or within the first year uh, in, uh, after childbirth. Uh, some of the medical terminologies that we come across, um, antenatal depression is nothing but a, a woman suffering from depression during her pregnancy. And postpartum depression is depression suffered by the women following childbirth. Um, these are some of the... Um, diagnosis that you know uh, uh, a pregnant lady after childbirth usually you know might experience these are postpartum blues postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis we are going to talk about postpartum blues and depression today so postpartum blues uh, um, most of the uh, uh, majority of the women suffer from this about 50 to 85 percent of the women suffer from postpartum blues it occurs during the first few weeks after delivery and uh, usually peaks on fourth or fifth day may last for a few hours or can last for up to few days usually the symptoms include feelings of sadness you know tearfulness you know uh, they might complain about anxiety irritability or mood lability also it resolves spontaneously within two weeks after delivery if these symptoms doesn't resolve and <clears throat> If patient is uh, having worsening of, you know, symptoms, not only these symptoms, some of the other depressive symptoms, then it needs, uh, you know, a, an evaluation by a behavioral health specialist. So uh, in regards to perinatal depression, it's usually uh, underdiagnosed and undertreated. Um, about 14 to 23% of pregnant women diagnosed with depression during pregnancy and among those 35 to 40 percent are in uh, low group low income group and minority groups uh, and 30 percent of those uh, uh, pregnant uh, postpartum uh, women who are diagnosed with depression uh, after childbirth usually might have developed a depression um, uh, even during pregnancy <clears throat> which uh, went you know undiagnosed and untreated so what are the risk factors associated with perinatal depression? <clears throat> so the risk factors could be, you know, uh, uh, if, if a pregnant lady had history of anxiety, history of depression, or any life stressors, or if the a pregnant lady has, uh, you know, lack of social support from the family or from the, you know, uh, from the community, low income status, or... Uh, single status, poor relationship quality with the, her family members. Um, and if the pregnancy is unintended or unplanned, uh, that can also lead, uh, is one of the risk factors for perinatal depression. And domestic violence, it is, in, um, it, it is shown that 3 to 9% of the partner in, uh, intimate partner violence can also cause perinatal depression. And smoking is one of the risk factors associated with perinatal depression. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about risk factors associated with postpartum depression. These are almost similar to um, perinatal depression risk factors, except for the last three, uh, which is uh, a traumatic birth experience, 
in the past and during childbirth preterm birth or infant admission to NICU and uh, breastfeeding problems are also risk factors associated with postpartum depression. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the comorbid illnesses that uh, can be present along with perinatal depression. Most commonly are the anxiety disorders, which are generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. It can also, um, a, a, a pregnant lady also can uh, uh, suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder or substance use along with perinatal depression. So what are the symptoms of uh, both perinatal and postpartum depression? So the, the uh, pregnant women or uh, uh, women who gave uh, um, child uh, who um, gave birth to a child can experience depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in doing things, significant changes in weight, either weight gain or weight loss, changes in appetite could be decreased appetite or uh, increased appetite, insomnia, which is uh, you know uh, lack of sleep and hypersomnia, sleeping too much, psychomotor agitation or retardation. Fatigue or a loss of energy, um, feeling worthless, or you know having uh, excessive guilt, um, also having cognitive difficulties like inability to focus and concentrate, or you know even to, it, it is hard for the uh, uh, for the women to make in, even simple decisions. Um, and the last but the most important one is if the um, patient is having thoughts of death, suicide, or dying. <laughs> So what happens if uh, the perinatal depression goes untreated? Um, it can cause poor self-care uh, to the pregnant women, uh, malnutrition that can lead to a lot of other complications in the uh, infant, non-compliance with the prenatal care. And the, usually the, this set of uh, you know uh, women might have higher rates of substance abuse. They also fail to recognize or report signs of labor. They uh, might uh, it might it might cause preterm delivery if untreated. You know, preeclampsia also can cause low birth weight, small for gestational age, can cause uh, um, lower APGAR scores in the infant, uh, impaired bonding with the baby, um, can lead to postpartum depression, uh, lower rates of breastfeeding, can also cause you know uh, relationship uh, issues. Poor parenting, which which includes you know um, increased fetal abuse or neonaticide and maternal suicide. <clears throat> so talking about suicide in perinatal and postpartum depression, it's one of the leading cause of maternal death in pregnant and postpartum women. <clears throat> Most common methods that are used are hanging, jumping, or, or falling. One in five postpartum deaths are caused by suicide. It is. Uh, very much under-reported and under-researched. The, the high risk for suicide is mainly uh, um, during 9 to 12 months after uh, delivery. <clears throat> so what will be the effects of newborn if the perinatal depression is uh, undiagnosed and untreated? So it may impair the neurocognitive development of the baby, uh, which can lead to you know, cognitive delays, developmental delays in childhood. Uh, babies may also develop you know, emotional and behavior problems, like you know, they have few facial expressions, less active, less attentive, can be very irritable. And also um, as they grow older, you know, they, can, uh, they have high risk of developing depression too. And uh, um, if we <clears throat> see the physiological markers, they tend to have increased cortisol levels and decreased dopamine and serotonin levels. So how do you how do we screen you know pregnant women um, when they uh, go to primary care settings or you know OBGYN settings? So the standard questionnaire that we usually you know administer to the pregnant women is PHQ-9 questionnaire and Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. Um, how, how often do you have to give, uh, do you have to administer these questionnaires to the pregnant women? So the first, well, the first time should be um, on their first prenatal visit, at least once in the second trimester, at least once in the third trimester, and um, um, immediately after you know, delivery at uh, first postpartum visit, and then you have to screen again at six and 12 months. Um, either in OBGYN clinic or in primary care settings. 
So this is how PHQ-9 questionnaire looks like. It's a very simple questionnaire, consists of nine questions. It uh, hardly takes five to 10 minutes for the patient to fill in. Uh, usually this asks about um, all the symptoms of depression, such as you know little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed or hopeless, trouble falling or staying asleep, or sleeping too much, feeling tired or having little energy, poor appetite or overeating, feeling bad about yourself, trouble focusing and concentrating, uh, either moving speak, uh, moving or speaking slowly uh, that you know other people could have noticed. And the most important one is having thoughts uh, you know, to be better off dead or having thoughts to hurt themselves. These are scored in you know, uh, four different uh, you know, categories, not at all, several days, more than half the days and nearly every day. <clears throat> This is Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. This is also administered in and, uh, uh, prenatal, antenatal, and postnatal you know, um, visits. Um, it, it also consists of uh, 10 questions. I'm not able to you know, uh, get the entire questionnaire. But uh, th these are all. This also takes maybe at the max, uh, you know, maximum uh, 10 minutes for the patient to um, complete the questionnaire. <clears throat> so, how are these, uh, you know, questionnaires scored? Uh, the PHQ nine questionnaire is scored as, you know, uh, zero to zero to twenty-seven, anywhere between zero to twenty-seven points. Um, and how it is categorized is zero to four is none or minimal depression. Five to nine is mild depression. When they score about 10 um, to 14, it's moderate depression. And uh, 15 to 19 is moderate to severe depression. And about 20 <clears throat> is severe depression. Same with the Edinburgh uh, postnatal uh, screening questionnaire. It has 10 questions. Um, if the score is greater than 12, or if they have an affirmative answer on question 10, which is you know thoughts of harming themselves or um, having <clears throat> Um, having thoughts to be better off dead, <clears throat> then we have to uh, intervene and uh, give them uh, resources to uh, help them out. So how do you manage uh, perinatal and postpartum depression? Uh, as per the screening questionnaires, if they, if they uh, come under mild depression, usually we refer them to psychotherapy. If um, they have moderate to severe depression, Usually, you know, they are referred uh, to a psychiatrist or a behavioral um, health specialist um, for medication treatment and psychotherapy. If the patient is suffering from severe depression, along with the medications, depending on the patient's severity, such as if patient is um, having, you know, is exhibiting uh, psychotic features or patient is uh, having thoughts to hurt themselves or th thoughts to hurt, you know, the baby, or if the patient is have is unable to care for themselves and the baby, then uh, usually <clears throat> that warrants inpatient hospitalizations. And depending on how they are progressing, sometimes electroconvulsive therapy as well. <clears throat> so, what are the psychological interventions that we usually admin, uh, offer uh, for mild mild symptoms of depression? So um, these are cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very commonly used, otherwise called CBT, interpersonal therapy, mindful-based cognitive therapy, and psychodynamic psychotherapy. And in regards to the medications, a lot of uh, uh, people have, uh, you know, they are a little bit skeptical about using medications during pregnancy. But as per the FDA, there is no significant increased risk for congenital malformations when treating a pregnant lady during pregnancy, around childbirth and after childbirth with the medications. Um, so most common medications that we use are antidepressants, which are SSRIs, SNRIs, and tricyclic antidepressants, which are TCAs. We also use atypical antidepressants in patients who are unable to tolerate SSRIs or SNRIs. Um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, so we usually, um, we don't use them that often because of very limited research and also they have a lot of drug-food interactions as well as drug-drug interactions. So we usually do not use monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So the, uh, there, there was an FDA warning before uh, 
2011 that you know um, SSRIs may cause pul persistent pulmonary hypertension in newborn. That I think that was released in 2004, but uh, um, FDA change updated uh, in December to 2011 that there is no sufficient evidence to conclude that you know SSRIs cause persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, which is a you know rare heart and lung condition. Um, so. Basically, they are recommended to treat depression during um, pregnancy as clinically appropriate. So what are the SSRIs that we commonly use in pregnant ladies? Uh, fluoxetin, uh, which is otherwise called Prozac. I'm giving both generic and you know, trade names. Um, um, citalopram is other, otherwise called Celexa, Acetylopram, Lexapro, Cetralin is otherwise called Soloft, and Paroxetin, otherwise called Paxil. And if a patient is unable to tolerate SSRIs, we can also use SNRIs. Or if patient is diagnosed with depression or anxiety prior to their pregnancy, you can always continue the medications that they have been on, except for monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, and some of the SNRIs that we commonly used in pregnant uh, uh, patients are venlafaxine, which is otherwise called Afixer, esvenlafaxine, otherwise called Pristate, Duloxetine, also known as Cymbalta. And uh, venlafaxine has an extended release form, which is uh, more commonly preferred compared to venlafaxine, uh, regular venlafaxine, as it can cause withdrawal symptoms. Other atypical antidepressants that we usually are Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin has different forms, XL, SR, depending on the um, um, how they are released in our system. And the uh, other atypical antidepressant that we use is mitazapine, also known as Remeron. Usually used, this medicine is used in uh, pregnant patients who are having insomnia, sleep issues, are also having decreased appetite and unable to um, uh, keep anything due to morning sickness because uh, this medicine tend to also help with the appetite. Other antidepressants are serotonin modulators such as uh, trazodone, nafazodone, vilazodone, and vortioxetine. These can also be used in patients who are unable to tolerate SSRIs, SNRIs, and, TC and TCAs. These are the T some of the TCAs that uh, we usually use in pregnant uh, patients. Some of these can cause sedation, so usually not preferred by most of the you know psychiatrists. But uh, these are very good medications for depression too. Uh, these are amitriptyline, alavil, clomipramine, also known as anaphranil, desipramine, also known as norpramine, doxamine, which is known as senequan, nortriptyline, pamelor, trimipramine, <clears throat> sarmontil. Imipramine, also known as tofrenol, amoxapin, also known as ascendin. So in uh, during pregnancy, there are a lot of changes in uh, a women's body, right? Uh, there is um, increase in plasma volume. Uh, there are a lot of hormonal changes happening in each and every trimester during pregnancy. Also, it also causes increases liver metabolism, thereby what happens is the medications are break, uh, are breaking down faster than usual during pregnancy. So as a result, uh, if a patient is stabilized on a certain dose of a medication, like an SSRI or an SNRI prior to pregnancy, usually you might have to increase the dose due to you know breakdown of the medications faster than usual during pregnancy to receive the same effect as prior to pregnancy. And uh, most of the uh, people, uh, patients have doubts whether they can breastfeed, um, um, you know, postpartum while they are on these medications. According to American Association of Pediatrics, you know, they recommend any drug which is a, um, a pass through um, a passes through breast milk less than ten percent is safe. So usually, all the antidepressants um, pass, uh, you know, uh, when they are administered to a uh, pregnant, uh, you know, sorry, postpartum, you know, depressed dep uh, uh, women who have postpartum depression, less than two percent of maternal weight adjusted doses passes through breast milk. So, as per the AAP, it is safe to be administered even after pregnancy, um, after childbirth. Um, during their postpartum period. 
So what are the first FDA approved drugs um, um, in uh, for postpartum depression? These are um, Brexanolone or uh, Zulreso. Um, it is approved in 2019. Uh, it is an IV infusion, needs to be hospitalized uh, for, uh, for the medication uh, for the medication to be administered. These are GABA modulators. Um, usually, um, patient might have, you know, a lot of sedation. So you, uh, when it, after the um, treatment, patient is usually, uh, the mother should be monitored um, so that, you know, they are not having you know, too much sedation uh, while uh, they are taking care of their uh, infants for uh, either it could be breastfeeding or uh, anything else to improve their bonding with the you know, baby. Zuranolone or Zuruzuve is a newer, you know, oral um, uh, first approved postpartum, you know, depression drug. Um, um, FDA, FDA approved in uh, October of 2023. Very recently approved, not still available in the market, but most likely it might be available in the next, you know, couple of months. Uh, this is administered about, you know, 40, anywhere between 40 to 50 milligrams daily for up to 14 days. Um, there is something called neonatal adaptation syndrome. Usually, you know, this affects, uh, you know, babies who um, are exposed to SSRIs uh, during um, the pregnancy. Um, not many uh, infants uh, um, experience this, uh, you know, these symptoms. About 25% of the infants exposed to SSRIs experience these, uh, you know, symptoms. Usually those are, uh, you know, a baby can be very jittery, restless, can be irritable, can uh, have insomnia or somnolence and also might have feeding problems. Not to worry about this. Usually, you know, symptoms are transient and uh, they resolve spontaneously and we don't need to, you know, medicate them with SSRIs. Um, um, Usually, um, the approach is conservative approach. You know, nursing, grooming, pacifying, and low stimulation environment usually helps the baby. All right, thank you.